The last lecture provided some reason for the free will enthusiast to be at least somewhat optimistic about the prospects for indeterminism. The work in neuroscience leaves open, clearly leaves open the possibility that indeterminism is part of the way the brain works. Lots of worries remain, lots of work remains to be done to clarify whether or not this is the case. And further, it's not at all clear what the future holds for the idea that we could have controlled free will. It's not clear that the neuroscience supports the idea that we make free decisions that we're in control of. In this lecture, though, we'll turn to something that looks like it only would have negative consequences, that only looks like a threat, that we'll look at some of the work on the neuroscience of conscious choice that many people find very disturbing. The story culminates with Benjamin Libet's experiments in the late 1970s and early 1980s, but the story starts, like many good stories, in the 60s. German neuroscientists in the 1960s explored the relationship between brain activity and voluntary motion. They had their experimental participants um, instructed to flex their fingers quickly at several po points during an experimental session. So they were told, during several points at this session, I want you to flex your finger, but you get to choose the specific time when you flex. So what the scientists were interested in was the relationship between electrical activity and the brain and voluntary movement. In particular, they were interested in the timing of the electrical activity in the brain and the voluntary movement. And they used two devices to test this. So to measure the amount of electrical activity in the brain, they used something called an electroencephalogram, or EEG. This is the same device that's used to diagnose epilepsy, in which case it's used to monitor the electrical activity that the brain is undergoing during seizures. So that's what they use to monitor the electrical activity of the brain. They measured the electrical activity of the relevant muscles by using an electromyogram, or EMG. EMG is also used to do things like detect diseases like muscular dystrophy. And so they use the EEG to measure activity in the brain, and specifically the part that they were interested in was the part of the brain associated with behavioral movement, because flexing a finger is a movement. And that's sometimes called the motor area or the motor strip. They used the EMG to measure activity in the muscle associated with flexing the finger. They didn't want anything as crude as just watching when the person flexed the finger. So they instead put the, uh, the EMG, they attached the electrodes to the person's wrist, the muscles in the person's wrist, to see when they first got those electrical signals. Now, they ran many, many trials, and by amassing a great deal of data, what they found was that there was a reliable pattern of electrical activity near the top of the head in the motor area, where one would expect, um, and that preceded the electrical activity in the muscle. The brain, activity, the brain activity that they identified started less than a second before the activity in the muscle, and the brain activity increased gradually over the remainder of this one second. So, to put it the other way, the muscle activity is preceded, so the activity that, that would generate their finger, finger flexing is preceded by a growing activity in the motor area of the brain, near the top of the head, and this activity in, in the top of the head, in the motor area, begins about a second before the muscle activity, a little less than a second. A natural interpretation of this is that the brain activity reflects the preparation for the voluntary flexing of the finger. Hence, it was called the readiness potential, or RP, because the brain is getting ready to produce motor behavior. So it's ready to move. That's what the RP is supposed to represent, the readiness potential. The neuroscientist Benjamin Libet, who lived from 1916 to 2007 and worked at the University of San Francisco Medical School, he built on these results to explore free will, to see whether or not he could examine conscious use of free choice in relation to the timing of brain activities. So he, he realized that the work of the previous scientists gave him an avenue into exploring this because what he wanted to look at was the relationship between the readiness potential, that activity in the motor strip, and the conscious intention to carry out the voluntary act. He wanted to know
what the relationship was between your consciously intending to do something and the brain activity that prepares you to perform that behavior. The earlier work on the readiness potential gives a really nice framework for this because it's a simple voluntary behavior, flexing the finger, and we already know something about the timing of the initiation of the motor behavior. So this is a really promising methodology to start from. The obvious obstacle, the, the really obvious thing that jumps out at you is that if you, if you tried to explore this, you'd say, well, tell me when your conscious intention occurs. Tell me when you first have the intention. If you ask them to do this verbally, then their response will itself take time to initiate and produce. So their brain would have to get ready to produce the muscular activity for speech. And since we're talking about very small time intervals here, everything is less than a second. He needed something more subtle than that. You can't just say, tell me when you first decide to flex your finger. So the way Libet set up the experiment was as follows. He told his, parents, his, his participants, much like in the earlier experiment, that they were supposed to flex their wrist whenever they felt like it. Um, but they had to flex their wrist during this time period, but they got to pick the specific times when they flexed their wrist. As in the earlier research, participants had their brain activity measured um, by the EEG and their muscular activity measured by an EMG. In addition, participants watched a dot moving around a clock face. It was a familiar clock face with familiar markings, 5, 10, 15, and so on. But the dot moved around really quickly. It moved around at about two and a half, a full rotation in about two and a half seconds. And then what Libet told them to do is he said, notice where the dot is on the clock when you are first aware of a conscious wanting or urge to flex your wrist. So that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to, to notice where the dot is and remember that to report later for when they first felt the urge, when they were first aware of the conscious urge or wanting to flex their finger. So after the whole thing goes through, after they flex their finger, then they tell the experimenter, oh, when, um, when I was first aware of the urge, the dot was on uh, 17 or whatever. This allowed the researchers to determine the relationship between when the participants are aware of their urge and when their muscles begin to flex. That's a minimal thing that allows them to do. Um, and for each participant, the researchers collected measurements from 40 cases. They gave them 40 trials. So here's a quick review from the, so far. From the subject's perspective, what they have to do is they know they have to flex their finger at some point, and they're supposed to, to note where the dot is on the clock when they first have the conscious urge to flex. The scientists, from their perspective, what they're doing is they want to know the relationship between when the person seems to be aware of the urge and when the muscle activity occurs. That's one thing they needed to know. And of course, awareness, the person's sub reported awareness, virtually always occurs before the muscle activation. Very few subjects act and then say, well, I became aware of the urge after I lifted my finger. That sort of thing didn't typically happen. Now. The really interesting question, of course, is what's the relationship between when people are aware of their urge and when the muscle or the motor activity is happening in the brain area? Some prominent scientists had suggested that the way it must work is something like the following. You make a conscious decision, say, to flex, and that has to happen before the readiness potential starts. That happens before the motor activity starts in the brain. And this seems like a really natural, common sense assumption, that it, it must go something like this, you might have thought. First, I consciously decide to flex my wrist, and that happens somewhere in my brain, and that decision gets sent to my motor system, and then my motor system starts revving up for the action, it's preparing for the action, and then it sends that signal to the muscle in my wrist. That seems like a really sensible hypothesis. That's a really reassuring hypothesis. If it turns out like that, common sense pretty much gets it right. So again, that is the idea is you make the conscious decision and that gets sent to, so you're aware of it right when you make it, and that gets sent to your motor area, which prepares for action, and then that gets sent to the um, flexing your finger muscle. Now, we need to get more precise about the timing because, again, we're talking about periods of less than a second. As in the earlier experiments, 
Libet found that averaging across trials, the muscle activity is preceded, so this is the activity in the muscle that runs the wrist, is preceded by increasing activity in the motor area. And in these experiments, the average difference there was about 550 milliseconds. So the, the motor area starts its gradual ramping up about a little more than half a second before the muscles in the wrist get activated. So now the key question is, what about the participants report for when they were first aware of their urge to move? Well, participants' reports for when they were aware of the conscious urge to move was only 200 milliseconds before the muscle activity. That means it was over 300 milliseconds after the beginning of the brain activity in the motor area. The, motor acti the activity in the motor area happens a third of a second before people are aware of having the urge. Now, Libet's own interpretation is that what happens here is that the brain unconsciously initiates the process of voluntary action. It unconsciously decides to move your finger. You unconsciously decide to move your finger. And only subsequently do we become aware of our intention to act. So let me summarize this again just to make sure it's really clear. What Libet finds is that the brain activity that's associated with preparing for motion, with getting ready to move, occurs several hundred milliseconds before the person is aware that he has the urge to move. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that these results got a lot of attention. Libet's work triggered an enormous amount of discussion, and it continues to be a major issue across many fields, in philosophy, psychology, the law, and, of course, neuroscience. So let's now try to follow through on some of the possible implications of the findings. Many subsequent writers took Libet's work to indicate that free will has to be an illusion. Libet himself actually has a very different view. He thinks his experiments help to locate where and how free will works. He thinks we have a brief window of opportunity, about 100 milliseconds, between when we're aware of our urge and our muscle activity. And during that period, we can exercise conscious free will. We can consciously veto, he says, the decision that our brain has unconsciously made. Again, we need to be more specific about the timing. People's reported awareness of the urge occurs 200 milliseconds before the muscle activity. But Libet points out that the last 50 milliseconds is unavailable for veto because at that point, the spinal nerves have already been activated and that you can't stop it. It's going to happen at that point. So Libet thinks that this still leaves enough time for a veto. And so he ran another experiment to try to show this. In this experiment, he told participants that they should plan to flex their finger at a preset time. So he said, you know, wait till the, the dot gets to a particular point, and then I want, you to not, I want you to plan to do it at that time, but then right before it happens, don't do it. And again, they measured the electrical activity in the top part of the brain, and they found a readiness potential did develop, in this case, as in other experiments that are more like this, where the action is pre-planned, the, the readiness potential emerges earlier. This time it's almost about a full second, whereas in the other experiments it was 550 milliseconds. Now, what Libet found was that while the RP, the readiness potential, increased over this second, the activity flattened out of the RP, of the, of the motor area, flattened out between 100 and 200 milliseconds before the preset time of action. And this suggests, he says, that the subjects, that's when the subjects intervene to stop the action. Libet concludes that the participants here were using their free will to veto the action at the last instant, at the last second, or should I say at the last hundred milliseconds. Thus, Libet says that the proper understanding of free will is not what people have thought. We don't have the free will to initiate a decision, but we do have free will to abort an unfolding action. Thus, he says that what we have is really better not called free will, but instead free won't. That this gives us the ability to either stop the action that has been initiated by our brain or to consent to its going to completion. Now, Libet himself thinks that this capacity for free won't is generated by truly free, undetermined choice. And that, he thinks, is where consciousness makes itself known. 
So although many have taken Libet's work to provide evidence against free will, Libet himself was actually a libertarian about free will. And he thinks that the veto experiments provide evidence for a libertarian view of free will or free won't. But of course, for these experiments, the veto experiments, there remains the question about whether the veto itself is generated unconsciously. For it's possible that the veto is also caused by an earlier unconscious brain activity. If the veto is caused by unconscious brain activity, then there'd be no reason to suppose that libertarian free will is ever involved here. And it remains empirically unsettled whether the veto does have this kind of unconscious basis. Libet's work generated enormous interest, as I said, and there have been numerous responses to the work. There have been a number of challenges to the data. But overall, the data have actually held up pretty well under considerable scrutiny. Subsequent studies have produced very similar results. And so I want to focus on a few of the more philosophical questions about the results. So what is the best interpretation of the data? Libet's official interpretation is that the reason we have the lag between brain activity and awareness is that the decision happens unconsciously and then the consciousness gets informed subsequently. Al Neely, who's a philosopher at Florida State University, has argued that Libet's interpretation of his results suffers from a lack of conceptual clarity. This is where philosophers think they can contribute to neuroscience. Often they say, well, we, we have the skills to draw distinctions between concepts, and one of the things that Libet failed to do was draw some important distinctions. So Libet tends to lump together things like urge, intention, decision, and wanting. He uses these terms as though they all mean the same thing. But Mealy says, at a minimum, we need to distinguish between intentions and motivational states like urges. And once we see this distinction, Mealy says, then we can give a much different interpretation to Libet's results. So Mealy uses an example to distinguish between intending and motivational state like wanting. He says that he wanted to go to a lecture with one friend, and he also wanted to go to a movie with another friend. But both events happened at the same time, so he couldn't do both. He opted for the movie, therefore he formed an intention to do only one of the things that he wanted to do. That is, he wanted to do both, but he realized that this was impossible and that he could only reasonably intend to do one of them. So he says intentions have to be different from wants because you can want to do two things that you know are inconsistent, but unless there's something very strange going on in your mind, you can't intend to do things that you know are contradictory, that you know can't be done at the same time. You can't intend to say, stay home and watch TV at five and also intend to be at the beach at five. Something similar holds for the distinction between intentions and urges. I can have urges for two opposing things. Say I have the urge to order the duck and the urge to order the flounder. But unless I'm feeling particularly gluttonous, it never think about trying to satisfy both of those urges, I only am going to form a single intention to order one entree. So I know that I'll end up intending to satisfy one of my urges, forming a single intention where you can have multiple urges in place. Libet's results are poised to threaten free will, at least they look like they might be a problem, if we regard the readiness potentials, the activity in the motor area, as showing the appearance or as evidence that the, the agent has already formed the intention to flex the wrist. Because that means we would have made our decision, formed our intention in a pre-conscious way. But, but Maley suggests that it's at least as plausible to say that what the readiness potentials reflect is an urge to prepare a flex, to prepare to flex. And that urge is unconscious. But the urge isn't the same as an intention. He says, well, you could form the intention to flex based on your urge to flex. And Mealy says this is actually the best interpretation of the veto experiments. What happens in those experiments is that the agent vetoes the urge before it rises to being a full-fledged intention to flex. So he says, we see the motor area registering an urge to flex, Accordingly, we see it getting ready to satisfy the urge, but then the agent decides not to follow through on the urge. And what Mealy says goes on here is the agent never forms an intention like, okay, 
let's go flex, let's flex now. And this Mealy says, suggests that even in the original experiments, the immediate intention to flex comes later than the awareness of the urge. Now, if we adopt Mealy's proposed interpretation, we can recover something that's fairly reassuring about the timing between decision and brain activity. Earlier I suggested that prior to knowing about Libet's results, one might have expected the results to have shown something like this. First, I consciously decide to flex my wrist. Then that decision gets sent to my motor system. My motor system starts revving up, preparing for the action, sends the signal to the muscle in my wrist. Well, it looks like that can't quite be right because whatever else is the case in these experiments, we know that the motor system is activated before we're conscious of the urge, decision, intention, whatever it is. But Mealy's interpretation does get us some way back to the sort of more common sense view because it allows us to say that what's happening is that the motor system is preparing for an action just in case I will ultimately decide to perform that action. So the motor system isn't locked into a particular action, action, it's just warming the engines. It's only when my consciousness decides to act on that urge that we get the true initiation of the action. And that's what Mealy says, at least that's a possibility for what's going on. And that's all really reassuring, I think. So Mealy gives us a way out of Libet's worry. But like Libet's interpretation, Mealy's interpretation of the results is in no way decisively confirmed. If Mealy is right in his interpretation, then things can proceed pretty much as before. But it's not clear that he is right. So we should consider some further questions that arise if we assume that Libet's official interpretation of the data is right. So one question is, do these results generalize to other decisions? So again, let's just assume that Libet's interpretation of the experiment is right. In these experiments, the brain decides to flex before the subjects are conscious of that decision. Does this tell us anything about the typical decisions we make in everyday life? It's worth stressing that the particular action that's performed in these experiments is extremely unusual. For one thing, most of our decisions aren't so weirdly spontaneous that in these experiments there can be no pre-planning. You can't, you can't plan ahead of time when you're going to flex your wrist, but, but for most of the stuff we do, we plan at least a little bit ahead of time when we're going to do it. In addition, the entire setup is really quite bizarre because what you're told is that you have to flex your wrist at some point in the process, but you get to pick when. Mostly, our decisions aren't under that kind of weird constraint. Now, of course, to do the science, Libet needed to have a pretty artificial arrang arrangement. He needed to have a situation in which he could control the surrounding factors as much as possible. And he needed to pick an action that would activate a readiness potential because that's where the science had already progressed to, to giving us a sort of basis to work from. And his idea for how to solve these problems was ingenious. So I don't mean to fault him for having presented the subjects with an artificial setting, but it does raise questions about whether his study can be generalized into a broader statement about action. Does it really tell us something about decision making in general or just something about this artificial and narrow confine of the artificial and narrow confines of an experiment on wrist flexing? There isn't any Libet style research on important decisions. There's nothing on moral decisions or even on important practical decisions. So we don't have any evidence on the matter that's directly showing that it does or doesn't work that way. So that is, we don't have any direct evidence on whether Libet style effects would emerge for important decisions. But at a minimum, if we accept Libet's interpretation of the flex results, we can't just blithely assume that the phenomenon he's identified is the exception. It might well be the rule. That is, on his interpretation, what he says is your brain makes a decision to flex and then it tells you about that decision. And if it's right in the flex experiment, why should we think that it's any different when you make a decision in everyday life? So let's say you decide to help a needy person. In light of Libet's work, a natural interpretation is that your brain makes the decision to help the needy person, and then your brain tells you about the decision. You think you consciously decide, but really your consciousness of the decision came after the decision was already made. 
In general, the model that this suggests is decisions come first, consciousness later. Now, what makes Libet's work so provocative is that if this model holds true for something like the flex case, then we know that at least some decisions have the structure. Decision first, consciousness later. And at that point, we really do need to wonder whether this doesn't hold for other decisions as well. In the absence of evidence either way, I don't think we can be justified in just rejecting the possibility that Libet has uncovered something general about consciousness and decision making. That is, in light of Libet, we're forced to recognize the possibility that in general our decisions are not conscious as we're making them. Before bringing this lecture to a close, I want to consider one final worry that one might have from Libet's results. Let's assume that Libet's interpretation is right. And let's also assume that his idea that decisions come ahead of consciousness is right not just for trivial decisions like when to flex, but for decision making more broadly. Would this lend any support to epiphenomenalism, the view that mental states are just byproducts that don't cause anything else? This idea of epiphenomenalism was introduced in Lecture 10, but now we can see how it might actually get some empirical traction from Libet's results. Now, obviously, Libet's results are about the relationship between decisions and consciousness. So, we can begin by recognizing that Libet's results provide no reason at all to think that mental states are never causal. Sometimes mental states seem to make a causal difference, even when you're not making a decision. So, when I think that there's a cougar in the bush, this thought, this conscious thought, causes my heart to race sometimes. When I cut my hand while slicing watermelon, I blurt out profanities. Or, when I watch the movie Jackass, I laugh despite myself. In these and many other cases, it's not like I'm making a decision. I have this conscious experience and it leads to a behavior like laughing or blurting profanities without looping through decisions. So Libet's results wouldn't touch these cases. Their consciousness might be playing an important role. It would only be a more restricted form of epiphenomenalism, somehow specific to decision making. But even in this restricted domain of decision making, the results wouldn't show that consciousness is completely irrelevant to decision making. So to take an easy example, memories of conscious experiences might themselves inform decision making even if decision making proceeds unconsciously. For instance, my memory that I decided to have the duck the last time I went to the restaurant might factor into my decision to have the flounder this time. That is, my conscious memory of consciously deciding to have the duck could then feed into my subsequent decision when I'm at the restaurant. I'll think, well, last time I decided to have the duck, so this time I'll have the flounder. Now, that decision itself might proceed unconsciously, but it could be on the basis of this conscious, this conscious memory that I had of making the decision in favor of the duck. So those are all ways in which Libet's results don't support epiphenomenalism. But the results might support a kind of limited epiphenomenalism about decision making. Because it seems to us like we consciously make decisions. That is, it seems like our decision making happens because we consciously direct it. But Libet's experiments suggest something else. The consciousness is not in the driver's seat of decision making. When we become conscious of our decision, he says, the decision has already occurred. The consciousness that we might have thought was driving the decision only occurs after the decision. So this is the key point. It's epiphenomenal with respect to the decision. The consciousness is not causing the decision. Now this doesn't mean that that consciousness is entirely irrelevant. So my consciousness that I made a decision might figure into later decisions. The fact that I was conscious of my decision to touch these cuddly looking cute cactuses that I saw in Tucson figure into my future deliberations and my future decisions. So it can prompt me to, to tell other people that I decided to touch this cute little cactus, but it was a really stupid decision because I ended up getting thorns all over my fingers. So that can be true. All of that can be true, even if the decision making process itself is always unconscious. So, Libet's results don't show that consciousness doesn't matter, but it does support the idea that consciousness doesn't matter in one of the places where we might have thought that it did in generating decisions. How bad is this? How big a change in worldview would it require to adopt Libet's view?
When I think about this as a cognitive scientist, it seems to me that there's nothing very mysterious or puzzling at all. The decision system does its job, then the conscious monitoring system does its job. Since the monitoring system can't do its job until the decision has been made, it's not surprising that it shows up later. It takes time for a cognitive process to unfold. In this mode, I start to think, of course it's like this. The decision has to be made before my consciousness can detect the decision. That the way you think about cognitive architecture just leads you to think that the processes occur sequentially. So how could it have turned out any other way? It seems very natural from a cognitive science perspective that it should be this way, that it should be decision first, conscious monitoring decision of decision comes subsequently. But when I think about this as a normal person, the results really seem bizarre. When I raise my hand intentionally, it seems to me like I am consciously deciding to raise my hand, that my consciousness is generating the decision. But if Libet is right, the consciousness is not generating the decision. So if Libet's right, common sense is quite wrong about the role of consciousness and decision. But how damaging is this to what we really care about when it comes to making decisions? Not too damaging, I suspect. Con to conclude that our consciousness always comes after our decisions, it would no doubt be disorienting. But it's important to realize that the decision might still reflect my values, my principles, my concerns, and so on. So what I most care about can still be what matters for shaping and making the decisions I do. The decision-making process can still weigh off my values and churn through my principles and interests in working towards a decision. It's just that this, this, the decision-making process itself isn't something throbbingly conscious. Rather, those processes happen in the dark, and consciousness only gets told about the results of the process. That is surprising, but I think we can live with it.